Chapter 11 Schaefer, Rash thought, was one tough hombre. If I had been beaten up and thrown off the fifth floor, he thought, I'd spend the next few days sipping chicken soup and watching Love Boat reruns. Schaefer just wanted to get back to work. Oh, they both slept most of the day and taken it easy that evening. Rash had made a run down to the hospital and talked the nurse into turning over Schaefer's clothes and wallet, made a stop at Schaefer's apartment for a fresher outfit, then come home and try to coax a coherent description from Schaefer of just what he had fought in that tenement. They talked over what it was, where it had come from, what it was after. All of it guesswork, of course, but Schaefer had had that last chat with Dutch to help him. He thought the thing was a hunter, the kind Dutch had talked about, probably the one Dutch encountered. After all, how many could there be? Schaefer told Rash the thing wasn't human, but he admitted he hadn't gotten that good a look at it, had only been in the same room with it for a few seconds in poor light. Rash didn't comment on that. But Dutch had run into it in Central America, and this one was in New York. Well, it had seven or eight years to find its way north. Maybe it had already gotten Dutch and was going on after his family. Or maybe Dutch had gotten away and it had mistaken Schaefer for his brother. In any case, Schaefer figured that it was toying with him, playing cat and mouse games. Killing Schaefer's own natural prey at the downtown tenement, killing Schaefer's allies on 20th Street, marking Schaefer. Schaefer didn't think it had intended to knock him out of the building. That had been an accident, and it hadn't bothered coming down after him because it wanted the chase to continue a bit longer. It didn't want to kill him while he was helpless. It wanted the sport of hunting him. It was all guesswork, all just talk, and that was all Schaefer and Rash did that first evening. But the next morning, bright and early, they were in Schaefer's car again, driving back to Manhattan. Schaefer planned strategy on the way as Rash negotiated New York's traffic. We can't let that thing call all the shots, Schaefer said. We have to track it down. Get at it when it isn't ready. Catch it off guard. How the hell are we supposed to do that? Rash asked. We need to find out more about it, Schaefer said. We've got to backtrack Phillips. He knows a lot more than he's telling. He's plugged into this somehow. He knew that thing was in town, and he's hiding something about Dutch. Something more than I know. I can feel it. I can feel that we're going to be canned if we don't bring McComb in on this, Rash replied. Look, Shafe, I haven't pushed you because I figure you have your reasons, but I've got to know what we're really up against. You saw that character up there, I didn't. You must have some idea of what's going on. Okay, so it's some kind of super hunter. Who sent it? Why was it after your brother? Who'd he piss off? The mob? Terrorists? Some foreign government? Sinatra's bodyguards? How about none of the above, Schaefer said. You want the truth, Rash? The truth is, I just don't know. It could be some kind of mutant monster on the rampage for all I know. It could be from outer space. Maybe Phillips is involved because it's some kind of bio-war experiment gone wrong. I just don't know. Rash started to ask another question, then dropped it. If Schaefer didn't know... More questions wouldn't help. At Police Plaza, they didn't go looking for McComb. They were scarcely inside the building when he spotted them and came charging down the corridor at them, fists clenched. There you are, he bellowed. About time you put in an appearance. You could have called, Rash began. You should have stayed in the goddamn hospital where you belong, Schaefer. I warned you. I've got the chief crawling up my ass wondering why one of my homicide detectives is pissing around in a federally sealed crime scene. Give it a rest, McComb, Schaefer interrupted. That's Captain McComb, detective, growled McComb. In my office, now. Neither of them paid any attention to Rash, and that suited Rash just fine. The order to McComb's office was directed at Schaefer, and as far as Rash could tell, he wasn't wanted. He was just as glad not to get caught in the crossfire in there. He headed for his own desk, ready to turn if either McComb or Schaefer shouted at him. Neither of them did. Instead, 
the two men marched into McCombs' specially soundproofed office. McCombs slammed the door behind them, then turned to the detective. Let me make this simple, he said to Schaefer. Since you don't seem to listen real good, I'm telling you, you keep messing with me and I'll have your job. Hell, I'll have you up on charges. I want to talk to Phillips, Schaefer said, cutting McComb off. I want to confirm. You're not hearing me, Schaefer, McComb shouted. Schaefer stopped talking and McComb continued. This isn't an official investigation. There are no feds involved here, as far as you're concerned. Phillips doesn't exist. Nobody's going to confirm shit. And those dead bodies? How are you explaining those? Schaefer demanded. Suicide? They all fired off all their ammunition, then skinned themselves? It's not your problem, Schaefer, McCone bellowed. Or mine either. It's a federal matter, and you just keep your fucking nose. Look, McComb, Schaefer interrupted. I want to talk to Phillips. It's personal, all right? Maybe it's nothing to do with this case. It's about my brother. I told you, Phillips doesn't exist, McComb replied, glaring. Schaefer stared back silently for a moment, then said, Fine, he doesn't exist. So let me talk to a figment of my goddamn imagination. You want to talk to anybody on personal business, Schaefer, that's your business, and you do it on your own time. I'm not going to bother the general on your behalf. You're my only contact with him, asshole. McComb stared at Schaefer. What did you call me? Look, McComb, I've got to talk to him. Fuck off, Schaefer, McComb replied. Listen, you shut up right now. You give me your word you'll stay the hell away from the feds and from 20th Street and from that tenement and you can go. You can go to hell, McComb, Schaefer said, cutting him off. Where do I find Phillips? All right, that does it, McComb said. You're history, Schaefer. You're going down. You're out of the department. He snatched up his phone and bellowed. Give me the desk, Sergeant. I want... Before he could finish the sentence, Schaefer's fist came down on the phone's base, smashing plastic and circuitry. Bad connection, Schaefer said. For a moment, McComb stared down at the broken phone, the receiver still clutched in his hand. Then Schaefer grabbed him by the front of his shirt and picked him up and slammed him against a bookcase. Law books and old reports tumbled down around him. Schaefer said calmly, Listen, you probably could have me fired, just the way you think, despite the union. I might even do a little time, lose my pension, six months behind bars, and you know what would happen then? He waited while McComb stared down at him in terror, then Schaefer answered his own question. Then I might get mad, he said. McComb managed to glance at the door and saw no sign of approaching rescue. He had this office rebuilt to his own specifications to ensure complete privacy. He hadn't wanted officers eavesdropping on confidential business. He regretted that now. Then he looked back at the expression on Schaefer's face. He saw the bandages on the nose and jaw, but most of all, he saw those cold blue eyes. Something in them looked dead, McComb thought, and Schaefer had told the truth. He wasn't angry. Not yet. Jesus, McComb said. Look, I'm telling you the truth, you'll never find Phillips. He's not regular army or special forces or even CIA. He's some kind of army freelance that isn't supposed to exist. And I swear, Schaefer, I don't know what's really going on. He wouldn't even tell me. He just ordered us to keep everybody out. To go through the motions and then forget it all. He wouldn't tell me a thing. No. Schaefer dropped McComb. The captain flung out an arm and spilled a shelf to the floor in a useless attempt to catch himself and landed sitting, sprawled on a pile of ledgers and reports. Can you reach him? Not anymore, McComb said. I had a phone number, but it's been disconnected. So, he doesn't trust you? Smart man Phillips, Schaefer said. I guess I'll have to try something else. He marched out before McComb could move to stop him. Not that McComb had any intention of stopping him. 
He marched on out through the squad room. Rash jumped up and followed him. At the curb outside, Schaefer turned and saw Rash. Good, he said. You can save me the cab fare. Rash had just wanted to ask what had happened with Macomb, whether they still had their jobs. But the expression on Schaefer's face wasn't anything he wanted to argue with. He went to get the car. After all, they could talk while he drove. A moment later, he pulled up at the curb. Schaefer climbed in, slammed the door and said, Kennedy. Kennedy? Rash turned to stare at him. Christ, Schaefer. You mean this has something to do with the assassination? Was the CIA in on it after all? I always thought that was just another crackpot conspiracy theory. Kennedy Airport, Schaefer said. Oh, Rash said. He put the car in gear, pulled out into traffic and headed for Queens, too embarrassed to say anything more right away. They were crossing the Williamsburg Bridge when he asked, So what did Macomb say? Nothing, Schaefer said staring out the window. You didn't fire us? Schaefer shrugged. Not you anyway, he said. Rash considered that as he turned onto the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. So you're going to the airport? Rash asked. Schaefer didn't bother to answer. No luggage? It's in the trunk. I keep a suitcase there. Rash grimaced. They were still using Schaefer's car, and that was just like Schaefer, always ready for a disaster. And of course, he hadn't mentioned it sooner and saved Rash that side trip to his apartment. Rash drove on, made the turn onto the Long Island Expressway, then said, So you're flying somewhere? Schaefer didn't bother to answer that either. Washington? Rash asked. Did you get an address for Phillips? Schaefer shook his head. Central America, he said. Rash slammed on the brakes. Central America? Are you out of your mind? Horns blared behind him. He pulled up to the shoulder. Keep driving, Schaefer said. You tell me what you're doing or I stop again, Rash said, as he pulled back into the traffic. Dutch told me the rescue mission where he lost his men was in Central America. And I think I remember enough of what he said to figure out just about where, Schaefer said ticking off the first of three raised fingers. So if we're right that it's the same one, then the killer was there once, right? Rash nodded reluctantly. Phillips said the killer likes the heat, and Central America's hotter than hell. Maybe it's home for whatever we're up against. A second finger came down. That's pretty weak, Shafe, Rash said. And finally, Carr and Lamb were meeting in that dump. And why would they be doing that? Because they were making peace, maybe? Why would they do that? Because they had a common enemy. And who could that be? That could be the Cali Cartel or the La Costa, trying to pick up where the Medellin used to be. Carr and Lam were cutting out the Colombians. And the Colombians didn't like it. That's the first motive we've got for that massacre that makes any sense. So the Colombians run a lot of their stuff up through Central America. The Kali especially. So maybe there's a connection. Maybe they hired this killer there. Or if he's not someone they hired, maybe they found him there. Or he found them. Schaefer held up a closed fist. And maybe this is all a coincidence. Schaefer almost shrugged. Maybe. But it's the best shot I've got without Phillips. Something happened down there eight years ago that ties into Dutch's mission. The murders, Phillips, that thing I fought, all of it. It's the only thing that makes sense. It doesn't make sense to me, Rash protested. That killer isn't in Central America now. It's here, in New York. Yeah, Schaefer said. But where? It's a big city, Rash. You know that as well as I do. If we're going to find that thing, we need a lead of some kind. And you think you'll find one in fucking Central America? Schaefer didn't bother to reply. They were halfway down the Van Wyck Expressway when Rash said, We ticked off some heavy players down there when we worked narcotics, you know? Some of those Colombians you mentioned? If any of our compañeros catch you, they'll peel your tan with a straight razor. Screw them, Schaefer said. 
It was Rash's turn not to answer. He drove into the airport and looked for an appropriate terminal. He eventually decided that American would do. How are you going to pay for this? He asked as he looked for somewhere to pull over. Is Macomb going to okay departmental funds? Hell no, Schaefer said. I've got credit cards. I'll put it on the plastic and worry about paying it when the bills come. Schaefer, that's, that's my business, Rash. Rash couldn't argue with that, so he didn't. As Schaefer pulled his suitcase from the trunk, he said, Listen, Rash, get Shari and the kids away from the city until this is over. Have them stay with your parents or something. Tell them it's a vacation. Tell them anything. Just get them away. It's a big city, Schaefer. Schaefer shook his head. I've got a feeling something ugly's coming down here, he said. Something that's going to make our Colombian friends look like something out of a Dr. Seuss book. I saw that thing, you didn't. He touched the bandaged lump on his neck. If it picked me because I'm Dutch's brother, and it's not just a coincidence, then maybe it went after Lamb and Carr because I wanted them. Maybe it hit 20th Street because I'm a cop. If any of that's true, then it might decide it'd be fun to go after you, partner. And like you said, I may be going to Central America, but the killer's still here in New York. So get out of the city, Rash, you and your family. Go somewhere cool. Then he turned and almost jogged into the terminal. Rash watched him go. Schaefer's nose and jaw and one hand were all still swathed in bandages, but he moved as if nothing had happened. When he was out of sight, the airport crowds, Rash got back into the car and started the engine. He sat thinking for a moment before he pulled out into traffic. He had some vacation time saved up. He hadn't planned to use it this soon and McComb might not like it. The department wasn't real fond of short notice vacations. But maybe a vacation would do Shari good, he thought. Maybe it would do them all some good. And, he thought, wiping at the sweat on his forehead, it would be nice to go somewhere cool.